And for those who are not here locally in the Chattanooga area, you will miss out because we're going to have 71 degrees today <laughs> in Chattanooga with uh, uh, two weeks before Christmas. So that's, that's uh, kind of strange, but it'll be an enjoyable day. So get out to everybody here locally. Get out this afternoon, go for a hike, enjoy some sunshine. You might not get some more again until about March or April. <laughs> All right, let's go ahead and begin class with prayer this morning. Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you so much for this opportunity to study. We pray that your uh, spirit will join us. We pray that you will bless our endeavors to tell the truth about you and the avenues will open for this message to light in the world and you will come again soon. We pray in your holy name. Amen. Amen. And uh, before we get into the lesson, I have a correction. I want to thank uh, Elise Nesbitt, one of our online class members who e emailed me a correction uh, from last week where I confused two Greek words. Um, I uh, said that the uh, word for grace is kairos, from which we get chiropractor, which in fact kairos is the root word for chiropractor, but the word for grace is charis instead of kairos. And so I can, you, you can see where my brain kind of twisted those, but we appreciate that. I put her whole email in here, and we thank her for correcting me on that. And then we're doing uh, lesson number 13 in the quarterly Jeremiah, and the title this week is Lessons from Jeremiah. And the memory text is Jeremiah 23, 5, and it says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that I will raise to David a branch of righteousness. A king shall reign and prosper and execute judgment and righteousness in the earth. Now I want to spend a little time on this, on this memory verse today. And let's dig in and compare scripture with scripture. First, when you hear this word, this idea, this construct, a branch of righteousness, what does the word branch kind of connote or entail? Why do you think they use the word branch? It's part of the Pardon? It's part of the vine. It's part of the vine. Okay. Yes, I like where you're going with that. So when people do their, quote, family trees, yeah. okay, what do the family trees do? They branch, don't they? Okay. Pardon? Hopefully. Hopefully they branch, yes. <laughs> it depends on where you live. <laughs> we won't even go any farther than that. Okay, normally they branch. Of course, Abraham's didn't branch all that much in some places, did they? Yeah. Okay, um, and, and the point of the branch, though, the concept is that it is an outgrowth of something that existed prior. So this idea the branch is going to branch out, I think it's, it's connoting this idea that there's a Savior coming who will be part of this creation. We a branch off of this creation. It's not going to be, uh, as some versions of, of Christianity have taught, that Jesus just appeared here as a human being. But no, he's actually going to be part of humanity, a branch of humanity, coming from the descendants of, of David, so to speak. And as you read that, did any other passages come to your mind on this idea of the branch? Well, Isaiah 11, 1 to 9. Let's look at Isaiah 11, 1 to 9. A shoe will come up from the stump of Jesse. From the roots, a branch will bear fruit. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and power, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And he will delight in the fear of the Lord. He will not judge by what he sees with his eyes or decide by what he hears with his ears. But the righteousness but with righteousness he will judge the needy. With justice he will give decisions for the poor of the earth. He will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, and the breath of his lips will slay the wicked. Righteousness will be his belt, and faithfulness the sash around his waist. The wolf will lie down with the lamb, the leopard will lie down with the goat, the calf and the lion and the yearling together, and a little child will lead them. The cow will feed the bear, their young will lie down together, the lion will eat straw like an ox, the infant will play near the hole of the cobra, and the young child will put his hand in the viper's nest. They will neither, ha they will neither harm nor destroy on all my holy mountain, for the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the water covers the sea." What's going on in this passage? I want to actually break this passage down and go through it verse by verse to kind of get this idea what this branch and what's going to accomplish. Notice a shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. What is this meaning? What is this describing? A shoot. What is it talking about? It's telling us our Savior is going to actually be part of this, this, this humanity, this species human, a biological descendant, a real flesh and blood being. From the roots, a branch will bear fruit. What kind of fruit? What kind of fruit is, the, is this, this branch from the, from the uh, root of Jesse, from David's descent? What kind of fruit will it bear? 
Well, the fruit of the Spirit is what we would think of. So a fruit of a perfect character, a fruit of a, of, a, of a being who lives in harmony with God's design. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and of understanding, the spirit of counsel and of power, the spirit of knowledge and of fear of the Lord, and he will delight in the fear of the Lord. What do you think all this means? What is gonna, what is gonna be, are they saying that this, here's, here's gonna be a descendant, a human being who comes along down the road from, from David's descent, but there's gonna be something different about him. He's gonna have the spirit of knowledge, the spirit of power, the spirit of all these things. Is it, is it saying that this, this individual is going to have a clear understanding of how reality works? A knowledge of God's character, a knowledge of his design, a knowledge of his purposes, a knowledge of what's happened in the, plan, in, in the great controversy, an understanding what's needed to restore and to heal, that this being is going to have all of that knowledge and perfect character as well. What do you think it means the fear of the Lord will rest upon him? Does it mean he will live in terror and dread? Afraid, needing a Xanax every time he thinks of God? The awe of God. No, the admiration, the awe, the excellent wonder, the joy of. This is what it means. And it's important to make that distinction because there's a lot of, of religion that wants you to actually live in dread and, and terror. Now, he will not judge by what he sees with his eyes, nor decide by what he hears with his ears, but with righteousness he will judge the needy. What does this mean? Now we're getting in, get into the, the nitty gritty of this now. What does this mean? To me, it's one of Jesus' greatest miracles is that he had insight into everybody. Nobody needed to tell him anything about himself because he looked deeply into the souls of other people. So he wasn't um, misled by their appearances, how they have approached him and so on. So you would then maybe put this Bible verse with what you're saying. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. It's more than just behavior. It's more than just the deeds that are done. It's the motive of the heart. And Christ is looking for the motive of the heart. So here's a being who's going to be able to see to the motive, and he's concerned with motive of the heart, not just with the behavior of, the, of, of one's actions. So might we say that this idea that he will judge the needy, what do you think about this idea of he will judge the needy? He will diagnose the sin. Oh, there you go. I like that very much. He looks at the heart. He sees what's wrong. It's like an MRI of the soul. He penetrates deep within. Search me and see the wicked way in me, O oh God, uh, for the purpose of diagnosing accurately what's wrong. He will diagnose accurately those in need of diagnosis, the needy, those in need of healing. Well, that's good. With justice, he will give decisions for the poor of the earth. What does this mean? When you hear the word justice, what law lens are you looking through? Looking through our, our human system of justice and rules? You're looking through design law. What, what is justice when you hear that word? The same thing as the righteousness of the one before it. Ah, Justice and righteousness are the same thing. So he's doing what's right, meaning he's seeking. And what is the right thing to do if you have remedy and somebody is dying of a disease and you have something that will cure them? What's the right thing to do? I'll bring them back to health. Yeah, bring them back to health. Unless you're a pharmaceutical company, then you have to charge them a lot for it first. Yes. Okay, but otherwise, if it's somebody you love and you love them, what you're going you're gonna to give whatever you have to heal them, right? You've got the remedy. So this is what's going on here. This is what we see. He is going to give justice in his decision. In other words, he's going to make decisions that are therapeutic, to, that are designed to uh, put a stop to, to destruction and sickness and put people in relationship with him so he can heal and restore them. And in those days, people thought that the wealthy were blessed by God and the poor were cursed by God. Or they, you know, and that sort of brings to the uh, prosperity God. <laughs> God wants you to be wealthy. God wants you to be, you know, prosperous. And so people were looked upon as sort of cursed by God. If they were sick, disabled, or poor, they couldn't be uh, blessed by God. And so this whole verse, this whole passage is kind of going against that, though, because he's not going to look at what he sees with his eyes. He's not going to look at the, how wealthy you are and how prosperous you are in the community. That's not what matters. Yeah. He will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth. Well, hopefully as you hear things like this, your mental computers start 
going through your database of biblical and other inspired sources, and you think, okay, what other Bible references or, or sources sound like this? Is there any other text that sounds similar to this? Can you think of a text maybe in Revelation that sounds similar to this? Rule the nations with a rod of iron. Rule the nations with a rod of iron. And how about the wicked are destroyed by the sword coming out of where? At his mouth. And so they have a lot of similarity, don't they? So he will strike the earth with a rod of his mouth. And then the next, next phrase in the, in the Isaiah text says, and with the breath of his lips he will slay the wicked. What does this mean? Many people read this, see, he's going he's gonna to slay him. He's going to judge him and he's going to kill him. Oh, say that louder. He's going to speak the truth. Now, these are symbolic things. The sword coming out of Revelation. There's an, what other symbolism does the sword represent in Scripture? Scripture. The Word of God. The Word of God. The sword of the Spirit, right? And the sword is sharper than a two-edged two -edged sword because separating bone and marrow and cutting to the dividing of the heart and so forth. Yes, this is the Word of Truth. So what comes out of the mouth? That's why the sword is coming out. It's the Word of Truth. But notice it's the breath he's going to slay. Now, in biblical stuff, when you think of breath, like the breath of God, what, what, what is this symbolic of? Life. The breath of life, yeah. Now, what is the breath of life for the universe? What is it that the universe is constructed to oper operate upon? It's the principle of love, right? Um, and so we have here in this passage the rod or the, tr uh, the sword of truth and the breath of life So is the principle of love, truth and love. The scripture is saying they will be slain when they come into God's unveiled glory and he unveils himself and in Daniel chapter 7, rivers of fire come out from before him 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands stand in it. The righteous stand. This is not harmful fire. Moses does not have third degree burns coming out of the presence of this fire. This is the fire of truth and love. The Holy Spirit fell. They saw two tongues of fire, split tongues of fire on the day at Pentecost. This, the fires of truth and the fires of love. It's only when the heart is hardened in selfishness and deceit that the truth is painful. We don't want to look at the truth. Have you ever found a time in your life when you really were trying to avoid some truth and you didn't want to see it? You didn't want to deal with it? And it was uncomfortable when you had to face it? How much more will it be on this day when, when they can't hide from themselves in their own condition? The truth, and this is what ultimately I think is saying he destroys by revealing himself, speaking truth and love, and those who have hardened themselves, they find it tor torturous. Next verse. Righteousness will be his belt. What do you think that's some, some saying? Righteous. What is righteousness? How would you describe righteousness? What is the state of righteousness? What is righteousness? I like that. Doing the things God does, she said. It's design. It's reality. Yeah, I like it. It's reality. So righteous, it, it is perfection. It is harmony with God. Harmony with his character. It's a state of being united with him in all ways. Aspects in the state of righteousness. This is the way things are. It's the state of being right. How God constructed things to be. It's not something mystical. It's not something magical. It's not something ethereal. It's not something with some type of... And we, we've, we've darkened down these words with our religion to, that righteousness seems like something amorphous. No, righteousness simply means those who are actually like God constructed reality to work. They're right. This is how it's supposed to be. Righteousness will be his belt. And so what does it mean? It means that he will... He will be in perfect harmony with God's design for life and this is what holds all the universe together. Like a belt holds things together. The whole universe is held together by God's right way of doing things. And faithfulness, the sash around his waist. He's reliable. He doesn't waver. He's constant. He's predictable. He's dependable. He's trustworthy. And then notice when all this happens, what is described next? The wolf lies down with the lamb. The leopard lies down with the goat. The calf and the lion. The cow feeds the bear. The, all, blah, blah, blah. all this stuff happens. And, and it says, uh, neither harm nor, nor destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth will be full of the legal pardon of God. No, the knowledge of God as the waters cover the sea. What do you hear happening? Can we get back to this state where we live in a state of peace, safety, security, 
without coming back to a knowledge of God. No, it's the key. So what's being described as the result of what the branch accomplishes is the infection of fear and selfishness. Survival of the fittest drive that infects humanity is being eradicated. Through the branch, a remedy, a divine healer comes who restores God's truth and God's love back into this species, back into this organism, if you will. Thus all things in heaven and earth are brought together under one head, united at one mint, called atonement. So with that in mind, what insights do you get from this text about the branch? Zechariah 6, 12, and 13. Tell him this is what the Lord Almighty says. Here is the man whose name is the branch, capital B, and he will branch out from his place and build the temple of the Lord. It is he who will build the temple of the Lord, and he will be clothed with majesty and will sit and rule on his throne. And he will be a priest on his throne, and there will be harmony between the two. To what is this text referring? Who's the branch? Okay, you can wake up now. Okay, Jesus is the branch. It, what does it mean? He will branch out from his place. Where, where was his place? And he branches out from his place, meaning he's coming to earth, right? Notice to do what? What's, what, what's this text say he's going to do? He's going to build the temple of the Lord. Now, put that idea in mind. He's, bra- he's leaving heaven for the purpose of building the temple of the Lord in the context of theologies that have a heavenly sanctuary that has always been in existence. That doesn't need to be built. That just needs to be cleansed. What, what's going on with that? Yes? He's building a living temple and it's made out of us. Is, is the living temple that's made out of us, is that different than the temple in heaven? Is it different? Well, if it's in two different locations, is that one? I don't know. I, don't know. I mean, our, that's a little too deep for me. I can't answer that. <laughs> it's a good, no, it's a good thought. You're exactly right. He is building a living temple. I guess the question I have for you is, in heaven, God's reigning on his throne. Lucifer begins his rebellion in heaven. Does Lucifer walk into a grand cathedral made out of gold that is pavement in heaven, uh, pearls and rocks and, and other inanimate material, look around and go, wow, what a magnificent structure you've built, Lord. This has got the grandest uh, skyline. Look at the, 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 the stained windows you've got here. This is an amazing place. Uh, would, you, would you mind if I had this place, Lord? Could I, could I sit up there on that, on that stool you've got up there? You call the throne. Could I sit up there? Now, the God that we know in Jesus, would he, if the, if the grand temple in heaven was a building made out of inanimate material, would he go, no, this is my stuff. You can't, you can't I'm not sharing. Or would he say, well, if you like this building, if it brings you joy, it's yours. I can make one a billion times even bigger in, in the blink of an eye. Do you think that, that the issue in heaven was Satan wanted to sit enthroned by himself in isolation in a building made out of inanimate material? That was his goal. He wanted to be first and foremost in the mind of <laughs> Right. He wanted to be first and foremost in the minds and hearts of intelligent beings. In other words, he wanted to sit enthroned in the living temple. In the temple constructed out of living intelligent beings. And in fact, he succeeded here on earth by dethroning God from the place of supreme majesty in the hearts and minds of Adam and Eve. And enthroning his own principle in there instead. And so Christ comes and branches out from his place in heaven for the purpose of cleansing the sanctuary, for the purpose of building his sanctuary. And remember what he said to the Jews, you'll destroy this temple in three days. What am I going to do? I'm going to raise it back up. They couldn't get their mind around it. They're too concrete. How many people in Christianity, maybe in our church, think concretely about the heavenly sanctuary? <laughs> they think mortar and bricks. I did until just now. <laughs> yeah, it's not mortar and bricks. If you look at scripture, the scripture is very clear that we are a temple of the Lord. The foundation of the apostles, Jesus Christ, the chief cornerstone. Know ye not your living stones built together into the house of the Lord. So let's read the uh, memory text. The memory text uh, in the lesson, again, from Jeremiah 23, 5. This is what they put in the New King James, and we're going to compare it with the good news in the NIV and see, see if we notice any other subtle differences here. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that I will raise 
to David, a branch of righteousness. The king shall reign and prosper and execute judgment and righteousness on the earth. That's the new King James. Here's the good news. The Lord says, the time is coming when I will choose a king, a righteous descendant of David. That king will, will rule wisely and do what is right and just through the land. In the NIV, the day, days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up to David, or from David's line, footnote, or from David's line, a righteous branch, a king who will reign wisely and, will, and do what is just and right in the land. Did you notice any differences in this? Do you think that's an accident that the new King James, with these words, were chosen for our lesson? That he will execute judgment in the earth. The other two versions said that he will rule wisely and do what is right and just. Do you hear execute judgment as the same as rule wisely and do what's righteous and just? I do now. <laughs> you, you do, but, but, yeah, yeah. Mo, but the, the word execute judgment kind of leans in a different direction, doesn't it? Does, it? does it tempt your mind to go down different trails of thought? Like judicial trails of thought, judge room, ju uh, courtrooms, and, and judges, and, and magistrates, and investigation of records, and, and punishing, and, and, and accountability, and, and these types of things. Could it be that the people who prefer that language are still struggling out of a imposed law construct in the way they think and see about God's law? fourth paragraph says such um, as faithfulness to God and obedience to his commandments such as true religion a religion of heart as opposed to empty and dead rituals that can leave people in a false state of complacency such as the people's willingness to listen to correction even when it cuts across what they want to hear such as true revival and reformation such as trusting in the Lord and his promises instead of the arm of flesh such as What does faithfulness to God and obedience to com his commands look like? What was said earlier about he doesn't look on the outward appearance. What does faithfulness to God and obedience to commands look like? Is there a difference between, or what is the difference between a religion of heart and one of empty and dead rituals is the lesson it's describing here. Can Sabbath observance be an empty and dead ritual? Can a person have a transformed heart and experience Christ and be saved and not have a Sabbath experience, not be a Sabbath observer, put it that way? What is the role of Sabbath? What law lens do you see it through? I want to suggest whatever question comes up like this, whenever you get a doctoral question, step back and say, what lens am I looking through? And here is a lens I would suggest that uh, Sunday's lesson, first paragraph, says the following. Seventh-day Adventists understand that the center, at the center of the great controversy exists a crucial issue. What is the character of God? Who is God really, what is God really like? Is he the arbitrary tyrant that Satan makes him out to be? Or is he a loving and caring father who wants only the best for us? These questions really are the most important questions in the entire cosmos. After all, what would our situation be if God were not kind and loving and self-sacrificial, but mean and arbitrary and sadistic? We'd be better off if no God existed than to have one like that. How well said was that? Well said. Let's give credit where credit's due. That was well said. And hence we have so many atheists. Yes. Who totally discard the God presented to them. Exactly right. We have so many atheists. And so the question, are, are Christians presenting a Christ and a God that is worthy of worship? Or are we presenting a presentation of God that thinking and reasonable people go, we're better off not without a God like that? Yes, Joel. I'm still thinking about your Sabbath question. And I'm thinking really, the Sabbath is more a gift than a rule. Mm -hmm. So Jesus said, the Sabbath was made... For man. for man, not man, for the Sabbath. So do we understand or present the Sabbath as an arbitrary test of obedience, which is I've heard it presented. I'm the only one that ever heard it presented that way. If we present it as an arbitrary test of obedience, then what kind of God have we just presented? 
an arbitrary God. And what kind of a laws and rules system have we just presented? And, what, and, and where do we lead people? Right out of the church and right away from God. But if we present it as a gift, what, what was the gift for? Why was it necessary? Back to the central issue. If you have that, that, that landscape of, of a controversy that, that there was actually intelligent life prior to earth, Job chapter 38, if you need a Bible reference for that, um, that there was intelligent life before God created intelligent life on planet earth, and there was a conflict going on, the, 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 this context that the Sabbath didn't exist until this planet was created. It's measured by the rotation of this planet in relation to that sun, which didn't exist until the sixth day of creation week, or the Sabbath didn't exist until the seventh day, and the sun, the fourth day of creation week of this planet. It was not always in existence. Many Adventists get uncomfortable that God's law is eternal, and, and the Sabbath's in the fourth commandment. If you say it's not always in existence, you're undermining the law. The written law, the Ten Commandment form of the law, was not always in existence. Is anybody uncomfortable with that? That's a form. God's eternal law, his law of love, always in existence. It cannot change. It's the reality upon which the universe operates. It extends from God's nature and character and self. But in sin, man had to have a distilled version to meet them in their condition. And God dumbed it down for them and put it in words that they could understand to provide a need at that place and point in time. That's why Paul says in Galatians, the law was added. It was added as a schoolmaster to convict, to diagnose, to lead us to Christ, to protect. Angels in heaven didn't need a law that sins passed down three and four generations or not to commit adultery or to honor their mothers and fathers. And there was no Sabbath law prior to the creation of this planet. It was a gift, as you say. So it's a law as in rule or law as in design. It's designed in some way. And what's the design of the Sabbath? What's it designed to do? What's it constructed to achieve? What's it? Relationship. Okay, celebration of relationship. To rest from trying to earn grace. To to rest. Remember. To remember. It, it's design is is in harmony with everything else that God has done. In every other intervention He's made to mankind is to reveal Himself to His creation. So it's designed as somehow to reveal Himself to us, and, and it's a weekly signpost in time and you think about if you're on your on a journey you're on a journey your head and maybe i'm the only one who's driven by interstate in a while you drive by interstate and uh you ever got in a moment where hey, did i take a wrong turn did, I, did I, there was a split back there did I, did I take the right split and what are you looking for next you're looking for the sign i'm, I'm still in interstate 75 i'm still interstate four wherever you're at you're looking for a sign to tell you're on the interstate the sabbath is a weekly sign Every week it comes around to remind, are you, you're, you're on a journey. You're on a journey through time. Are you on the journey on the right path through time or have you gotten off? And, and the Sabbath every week reminds us this is what, what the journey is leading toward. What's the journey leading toward? A universe that functions like God designed the Sabbath to function. And how did God design it? In the context, truth was presented over time in love and God rested his case. I rest my case Universe, take 24 hours aside. Think for yourself. Truth, love, freedom. It's a weekly signpost of God's methods and design. And Sabbath keepers are the people who, who remember that sign, but also practice that in the way they live. These are they who not, do not love their life so much as they shrink from death. They don't love their self so much that they're survival of the fittest. They truth, love, freedom. Yes? I think if you look at the miracles that Jesus did on Sabbath, I think the meaning behind those miracles, why he picked a particular person on the Sabbath to do what he, even though it was going to cause controversy, one was maybe to uh, initiate a discussion with the rulers of those days, but two, I think it shows he's giving an indication through his miracles of what the Sabbath should be to us, recovering our sight, removing paralysis. Uh, etc. All the different ones he did on Sabbath are very insightful as to what he means Sabbath to be. So another signpost and what he invests in the Sabbath while he was here on earth, he's telling you if you follow the signpost, what's happening on Sabbath? Healing, recovery, restoration, regeneration, freedom from oppression. Uh, this is what I'm leading. The signpost through time is leading to a universe back to my original ideal. That's what the Sabbath is for. And so who, somebody who wants to get you lost you know, back in... Uh, World War II, uh, when we invaded uh, Europe to, to take it back from the Germans, they, they had, uh, the Germans sent uh, teams that went behind allied lines and changed the signposts on the roads. 
they actually would turn them the other direction. So troops coming along would turn and go the wrong direction. They, they did this. this was a, if you want to get somebody lost, you change the signposts. Okay. Yes. A data got set aside for us to, to rest in his gift and appreciate it, his gift of creation, salvation. And one that just came to mind when you were talking is, you know, when we're in a new heaven and new earth and we're all going to come before God every Sabbath, the whole idea that this caused a division in heaven, or like the questioning of God in heaven, there's finally going to be peace and it's going to be a finished work of God again that the whole universe is going to be able to appreciate every week. And the evidence of what was transpired here and what was achieved persists for all eternity future. So the sign at post is never taken down because it's always pointing to a continual eternity of, of God's design, truth, love, and freedom. One way is the signposts get turned, by the way. The Sabbath is an arbitrary test of obedience. You've just turned the signpost. You might have the right day, but now you're going the wrong direction with the day. You're going down the direction of an imperialistic God who will punish you if you don't keep the day. And the day now, which day you actually turn your TV off on, which day you actually don't go shopping on, which day you actually behave all this external behavior on, this is, this is now the day that God will use to determine who's loyal to him or not, and he will kill those who don't do those things on this day. You've just turned the signpost. That's for the Jews. The Jews wanted Christ off the cross by sunset so they could go home and observe the day. They had the signpost turned in the wrong direction. They, that was also a problem in Israel with the cities of refuge. They would turn the signposts. Uh, yes. Yeah. Makers would, would do that. <laughs> I was going to say, to me it's also not just reminding us that we're on the right road, but it's God's way. I mean, what what more do we want to do for our children? I think of my son is to just let him know that I'm always available for him, that I'm always right here. And every week we're reminded, he's thinking about us. He's right here. We're, he's available to us. And to me, that's what makes it more special. So seeing, and this is what I do with patients all the time. There are events, there are facts, and then there are interpretations of events and facts. And how one interprets events, so there's a Sabbath that's, that, that it is. How do you interpret it though? What law lens do you see it through? Is it uh, through the lens of a, an obligation that restricts you in the way that I, I was experienced it often coming up through my adolescence was uh, the day of, of least liberty and least freedom, the day of most restriction, the day most oppression, the day we could have the least amount of fun, the day that you would get condemned if you should smile and laugh. I mean, that, that's, how, that's one way to observe it. Or the, the day didn't change, but my whole way of understanding and perceiving and, 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 and interpreting the meaning of it has changed, which changed the whole experience of it. There's a paragraph, third paragraph, quoting from the Great Controversy. He says, Never will be forgotten that he whose power created and upheld the unnumbered worlds through the vast realms of space, the beloved of God, the majesty of heaven, he whom cherub and shining seraph delighted to adore, humbled himself to uplift fallen man that he bore the guilt and shame of sin and the hiding of his father's face till the woes of a lost world broke his heart and crushed out his life on, the cro on Calvary's cross, that the maker of all worlds, the arbiter of all destinies, should lay aside his glory and humiliate himself uh, from love to man will ever excite the wonder and adoration of the universe. What does it mean he bore our guilt and shame? When I ask questions like this, hopefully the first thing you're going is, which law lens am I looking through? Which paradigm am I looking through? Am I looking at that traditional penal view? He bore our guilt and shame. Somebody was guilty. Somebody had, to, somebody has had to be condemned. Somebody had to pay that price. Am I looking through design view? And if I look through design view, what does this mean? He felt what it's like to be out of harmony with his character, his design. He bore our guilt and shame. Bore. Have you ever had to bear somebody's dislike of you? Have you ever had to bear somebody's condemnation of you? Have you ever had to bear somebody's uh, disgruntled attitude towards you? Have you ever had to bear someone's lies about you? Have you ever had to, have to bear the blame that you got when you were innocent? You bore the guilt of someone else. You were blamed for something you didn't do and you had to bear it. Is this what it's talking about? See, this is a, pro this is a reality experience not a legal transaction. And how did Jesus bear it? It's very profound. If you read Hebrews 2, 12, 2, let us, let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, 
scorning its shame. Scorning its shame. Or despising its shame in some of the old other language. Despising its shame. And sat down at the right hand of the throne of majesty. He bore the shame, but how did he bear it? As a legal process that he had to do? Or Christ despised the shame of the cross because he knew that he, who he was, and that the shame of the experience was actually upon those who rejected him and crucified him. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. They think they're shaming and humiliating me. But I, when I am lifted up, will draw all men unto me or all beings through the universe to me. Uh, This is the greatest demonstration of God's character of love and self-sacrifice throughout all history. This is not a moment for Christ to be ashamed. This is a moment for human race to be ashamed. This was the shame of humanity that Christ bore under. We should be ashamed for what we did to him. This is not some shame that he put upon himself that he then was ashamed. He wasn't ashamed. Do you see the difference here? How many times have you thought about it? Well, he was guilty and he had to be punished and the guilt had to be put upon him and and every sin, past, present, and future is placed upon him and he had to suffer under that. This is not the process as I understand it. Yes, he bore the guilt and shame. He absolutely did bear the guilt and shame. Our guilt because we were guilty in how we treated him and we were shameful in how we treated him. And he bore it with grace and with dignity and with love and with forgiveness. He bore it. Yes. Is this what, what scripture means by if we if we misrepresent his character either in a word or deed that we crucify him all over again? <clears throat> yeah, we hold him up to public disgrace. We we disgrace his character and name when we when we teach this penal substitutionary garbage. It's a disgrace because it makes God out to look like an arbitrary being whose character is no different than yours or mine. He's just more powerful than us. So what was it that crushed out his life? It was the result of God setting him free to reap what he voluntarily chose. And what did Christ choose to do? Remember at Gethsemane, Father... This cup passed me, but not my will be done, thy will be done. See, Christ chose. No one can take my life. I lay it down freely. This is an act of voluntary sacrifice on Christ's part. God respects true liberty. He set his son free. God simply stepped back and didn't intervene to stop the process. But God, did God lay a hand on his son at the cross? No. Did he rain fire down? Did he torture him? Did he beat him? Do you understand that penal substitutionary theology teaches that God killed Christ because justice required that the judge of the universe must execute judgment on the sinner. Christ takes the sinner's place, therefore God killed Christ at the cross. This is, this is an absolute fraud in the whole world. This is the, the wine of Babylon. The whole world is drunk on the wine of Babylon. And they're intoxicated. And they teach this this stuff that keeps good people powerless. There's no victory in their life because they live in fear of the God who sent Jesus to heal and restore. If you go down this view, which, which they have the view of God killing Christ at the cross, it makes God out to be the source of death. So what I mean. Death comes from him. I can't tell you. I've had interactions with Adventist pastors recently in email. And they're arguing, yes, justice requires, in the end, God must kill the wicked. God is the source of inflicted death. God must do this. They, they're teaching Eastern philosophy. Eastern philosophy teaches eternal dualism. The universe in which good and evil exist together for eternity. Life and death exist together. They're teaching that death originates in the character of God and comes out from him as punishment. Thus, through all eternity, we have a God who is the source of life and the source of death. This is dualism. It's a lie. God is the source of life. Death is the result of separating from the source of life, deviating from his design. It teaches that if God were not to inflict death, if God would simply get a little anger management and hold himself in check, that sinners could live eternally in sin because there really isn't anything wrong with sin other than it offends God and then he uses his power to kill you. Yes? I remember correctly from... uh didn't God, didn't he feel weird that all sinners are going to feel that they'll come into harm with them and that was 
being removed from his presence? Yes, yes, yes. That's why I said God set him free. He withdrew his presence from him. Christ felt the agony. See, Christ had a real unity with the Father. So think this through, guys. How hard would it be for you to be separated from the person you love the most in the world? How hard would it be for you to be separated from, I don't know, Saddam Hussein, Osama bin Laden, uh, you know, one of these people that you never get to see them or talk to them again? Okay? The, the closer and more intimate we are, and that relationship is fractured and torn away, that, that's much more painful, isn't it? Yes, and so Christ experienced the Father's withdrawing presence in a level that no human being has ever and ever will. See, he was left alone without the Holy Spirit intervening. When we are abandoned, when martyrs are, are stoned and burned at the stake, Stephen, you know, Stephen's face begins to radiate. Why? Because the Holy Spirit's being poured out. He had peace. He sings. He, he, he has, they have, they read the book of the martyrs. But Christ bore this experience alone without the presence of his comforting Father's presence to help him through it. Yes, it was terribly agonizing, sure. It broke his heart, and we read about how his heart was, was crushed out by that, yes. My question is, how do we approach this? Who killed Jesus? Was it Satan, or was it God? Are, are, are you asking because there's some confusion? The, evid the evidence is unclear? When we talk to someone, what, what, can we say, you know, can we ask him a question? Who killed Jesus? Yes. Satan, Satan or was it God that killed him? In a way, God, they might say, well, God withdrew away from him, so that killed him. So, <coughs> God killed him. So, so God withdrew his protective hand, which gave Satan and the evil men more freedom to act. Now, is, is the removing of the protective hand the same thing as inflicting harm? Why didn't, if Satan has more freedom to act, was Satan not free to do what he said in the wilderness? What did he say he would do for Jesus in the wilderness? If you bow down to me, what will I give you? All the kingdoms of the world. So when God removes his protective hand, Satan was free to have the king, all the kings of the earth bow down to Jesus and put Jesus on the throne. He could have done that. Why didn't he do that? Because it was not God killing. Satan is the source of destruction and death. Satan is the one who inspired this. And that's why the Bible says Satan is a murderer from the beginning. We have Jesus' own words that Satan is the source of death. He's the beginning source of murder. So we have to make a decision. Believe Jesus, Satan is murder from the beginning. Or go with modern Christianity, God is the source of inflicted death. The wages of sin is death. Sin when full grown makes forth death. Or God is the source of death. And so this is, and if you value Ellen White, Ellen White says explicitly in Desire of Ages that at the cross, Satan revealed himself as a murderer and uprooted himself from the sympathies of heavenly beings. Yes? Well, Satan couldn't kill Jesus until God pulled away. And until Jesus also, in his own in, in individuality, chose to surrender to it. No one can take my life. So Jesus had to choose. This is a different issue. And I thank you for bringing this up. Well, one more thing. I mean, the absolute separation from God is absolute control of, under Satan's power. And he will kill you. That's his whole goal. So God absolutely separated and he was absolutely under Satan's control and he did kill him. That's his goal for all of us. And just recognize at the cross though, Jesus was not in the same position as the thieves. No. He wasn't helpless. He could have used his own powers yes. that you and I would never, we'll, we'll never be tempted with that. But he could have used his own powers to stop it. Okay? Boy, I have so much more in the lesson. Yes, way in the back. Um, from Renee, my understanding is that Jesus died from a broken heart at the separation from his father, Jesus is the same. Yes, we, 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 we said that already. We said that. No, as his father, if the separation from his dad was bad enough to kill Jesus, what torture did God experience when his son died? Yes, exactly. The father was suffered at the same. That's exactly right. So that's the other side of that same coin when you love somebody and you lose them. So God the father was also having that same torment of heart going, that he was going through. So this idea, though, that God kills, though, it has so many distortions. It makes us afraid of God. It incites fear. It undermines trust. It keeps people trapped in the cycles of sin, powerless to break free. It distorts how reality actually works. We actually get a worldview that we begin practicing that doesn't actually work because that's not how reality works. It shuts down thinking and prevents the developing of the image of God in man. 
It justifies the use of coercive and destructive power, and Christians will seek to gain control of governments, to pass legislations, to force their own ways and morals on the world because this is how they see God working. It creates a disparity in the Godhead where we have a member of the Godhead who is the judicial enforcer of punishment and a member of the Godhead who is the gracious lover of our souls that tries to protect us from that one. Uh, It sustains Satan's allegation that God is arbitrary and breaking his laws requires inflicted punishment. So with all this in mind, we're still talking about this idea of Jesus coming to build his temple. He's coming to build, he branched out to build his temple. If you think about it, when God let Jesus go, Jesus made a choice. I'm going to die. And God honored his choice. And the pain it must have brought to God, it's the same pain God's going to feel at the end of time. Yes. He has to let people go because of their choice. Yes, and they understand the choice of Christ at the cross is different than the choice at the wicked in the end. So many people, because of the penal substitutionary, false, complete paradigm, and they believe that, well, your, pun- your penalty has to be paid, and what's the penalty is eternal death, therefore Jesus died the second death, and they teach this, and you, to suggest anything other than that, it terrifies them that their penalty isn't paid, and they run away, closing their ears, I can't hear, I can't hear, don't listen, you're a heretic, don't talk to me. That's what happens. But the experiences are completely different. See, the wicked choose to run away from the Father, hiding from him. Hide us from him who sits on the throne. Jesus died longing to see his Father. He, he, was, he was brokenhearted because of the separation from his Father. The wicked actually are died when Father reveals himself. The brightness of his coming destroys them. And they run and hide and beg. It's, it's actually opposite things happening. The wicked die in the end overcome by selfishness. Christ died when love... Self-sacrificial love destroyed selfishness at the cross. Get your mind around that. In the brain of Jesus Christ, he was tempted in every way just like we are, yet without sin. And we are tempted when we're drug away and enticed by our own desires. Christ was tempted on the cross with unimaginable human emotion to act in self-interest. And you see, it was not only internal, but external. The devil kept plying on. Look, read, read the transcript. Everybody coming up to the cross is going, save yourself, save yourself. Come down off the cross. We'll worship you. Just come off the cross. Use your power. Save yourself. We'll worship you over and over again. Can you imagine the temptation knowing he could? And at every turn, he instead denied self and sacrificed self in love. Thus, he established his temple He cleansed the temple. And it says in Hebrews chapter five, verse eight, that once he was made perfect, he became the source of salvation for all who obey him. What do you mean once made perfect? I thought he was always perfect. Once he was always sinless. Bible perfection is having a mature character perfectly developed in harmony with God's design so that nothing can shake you out of it. Christ developed that perfect character and eliminated this infection of survival of the fittest at the cross. His death was the cure, the remedy. The wicked die in the end overcome by the disease. These are not the same thing. Satan wants you to equate the two so you will not benefit from what Christ has done at the cross. Yes. Yes. I've been struggling with saying this. I know this is a little semantics, but, you know, I guess my, the conflict that I have is, well, Jesus laid down his life, but then God let him go. And it, I just, all of a sudden, I saw a parallel where we as human beings, in the end, have chosen to separate from God. We want to hide from him, and we've gone. And if Christ is the one that laid down his life, is it possible that God didn't pull himself away from him, but God's, Jesus said, let me go, it's time. And then God left. But basically, that was God, that was Jesus laying down his life, giving his life, giving it up by saying, I'm, you know, let me go and I have to do this. And now I'm under Satan's power, so to speak. That's kind of... Yeah, I, no, I think that's exactly what happened. You see that happening in Gethsemane. You see it happening yes. in Gethsemane. So it was a cooperative decision. Remember, the, the Godhead were in this jointly, cooperatively, in this whole decision-making process. Um, I'm not going to read this whole quote. It's in here, Sarah of Ages 161, just simply that every created being from birth, from, from the bright and holy seraph to man, should be a temple for the indwelling of the creator. Um, because of sin, humanity ceased to be a temple. Christ announced his mission when he cleansed the temple, that his mission was to cleanse the, the human mind, the, the soul, from the defilement of sin and reclaim this being to be a temple for the Lord. It's in the, it's in the, it's in the notes.
And then it goes on to quote Malachi 3, 1 through 3. Way in the back, question in the back. Malachi 3, 1 through 3 says that, that the, the Lord who you seek will suddenly come to his temple. And when he comes, he cleanses what? The Levites. The Levites. In other words, the cleansing of the sanctuary uh, described in Daniel 8, 14 is actually the cleansing of the individual building blocks made, which are the living beings that make up the heavenly temple. That's what he's here to cleanse at the end of time, you and me, our hearts and minds. Yes? Can you ask Tim what would be wrong with the idea that the wicked are destroyed when they are converted to an understanding of the truth so that this would say that all of the wicked are converted to understanding the truth and God destroys them by this way? I don't like the word conversion. Conversion means that their heart is in harmony and unity with. So I think conversion would be a subtle misdirection of what's happening. It, the Bible does say in the end that every knee shall bow and uh, heart and mouth confess. So there will be an acknowledgement of the truth. But that acknowledgement is not a conversion. It is a grudging admission uh, that, that reality is what reality is and their denial will not work to deny reality any longer. But that's not a conversion. I would not use the word conversion. Conversion means a heart agreement. They still don't want to be with Christ, they still don't like his methods, they still would throw him off the throne if they could. They're still alienated from him, but they acknowledge the, the reality of what reality is. Um, boy, there's so many things I wanted to share with you in the lesson today. I'm going to have to just jump ahead. Um, whew. Okay, Monday's lesson. I know, I'm jumping ahead, right? I was going to jump ahead, maybe, maybe I'll jump, because it, cause Monday actually builds into then, and we're going to jump to Thursday, from Monday to Thursday. Um, so first paragraph, it says, uh, there's a document that records God's endless dispiriting struggle against organized religion, known as the Bible. Did y'all hear that? There's a document that records God's endless dispiriting struggle with organized religion, known as the Bible. In other words, it's describing how God is constantly working with these religious people, but their religion keeps getting in the way of what God's trying to do. Now, the lesson goes on to say that's not quite true, that God has always had organized religion and so forth and so on. I would, I would actually question some of this, uh, with this idea of organized religion. What was the religion of Adam and Eve in Eden? What ceremonies, what rituals, what rites, what procedures, what creeds? Were Adam and Eve religious in Eden? Were they religious beings? They well, they were. No, no, they didn't <laughs> yes, but what, what creeds, rites, rituals, procedures did they participate in? Yes. They had, had a ritual. Every evening, God would come and talk with them. Yes. So the, the ritual was relational. Right. It was experiential. Right. Okay? It was, it was, a, it was a, a face-to-face conversation. Um, their religion was reality. This was, get your mind around. Their religion was reality. God and his creation, which operate like this, and they are in perfect harmony with, and they actually experience God, they grow in his grace, they are part of that reality. That's their religion, operating in harmony with God's design. And what will our religion on the new earth look like? I think it'll look just like that. Today, though, religion too often binds where Jesus sets us free. Religion separates and divides while Jesus unites. Religion blinds with symbols, rituals, works, while Jesus restores understanding with reason, explanations, and reality. Religion focuses on self and how I can be saved, where Jesus focused on the Father and what he's like. If you had to actually look at the history of humanity, what occupation has been the primary historical occupation opposing the work of God on earth? Church leadership. Clergy. Seriously. Aaron built the golden calf. Nadab and Abihu misleads the people. The sons of Samuel abuse the people. The priests uh, during the time of Elijah and beyond lead in idol worship constantly. The Sanhedrin at the time of Christ opposed Christ. The, uh, the Jewish leadership, uh, church leadership opposed the apostles. The clergy in the dark ages and throughout the Reformation. What about today? Now, how many seminary trained clergy did Jesus select to be amongst his 12 apostles? <laughs> Saul of Tarsus, now let's be clear, Saul of Tarsus was seminary trained. And when he converted, he became very powerful doing the Lord's work. But only after his conversion and three and a half years in the desert with Christ, relearning and understanding the reality of all the, and unlearning all the stuff he was taught in seminary. 
So he had the facts, he had a lot of data points, but those data points were in a filter that was all false. And he had to retake all those data points and reprocess them in a reality-based filter that he learned three and a half years. And then he was a powerful force for the Lord. Now to be fair, God has had many great people in the clergy. Samuel, Paul, Nicodemus, Joseph, Arimathea, Luther, Tyndale, and many other before, many great people. So I'm not saying that one cannot be in the clergy and be on God's side. Of course you can. What I'm saying though, is that the clergy is an occupation where Satan seems to place his workers with very powerful effect. And if you think strategically in a war, of course, you want to get your spies in the hierarchy of the other organization. And of course he's going to do that. We would just be foolish not to recognize that. And so how do we protect against that? Back to biblical principle. Let every person be fully persuaded in their own mind. Each person should think and weigh the evidence for themselves. I am not here to tell anyone else what to think. Boy, um, Use multiple threads of evidence. Yes, multiple threads of evidence. Bottom pink section in Thursday's lesson says, um, in what are you putting your hopes? How can you learn to trust more and more in the promises of God and, and their, their ultimate fulfillment in your own life? This is a common thing we've heard. I'm going to challenge you guys on this. Should we rest our hope in the promises of God or the God who promises? Should we rest our hope in the shed blood of Jesus or Jesus who shed his blood? Should we put our hope in the righteousness of Christ or the Christ who is righteous? Now you may say this, is, you may say, well, you're just making semantics. You're making semantics. Am I? Think, think through the, the connotation and subtle difference. The first three ways of phrasing it, we put our hope in the promises of God, the shed blood, and the righteousness. These become commodities. Right. Commodities we can possess and we can wield. And so we can go to God with the promises of God, very much like a pagan dicks out their incantations so they can say the right words and then they can control their deity. And so we go with the promises of God. He's promised it. We can corner him. He's got to do what we want. <clears throat> We go with the, with the blood of Jesus. Uh, I, I've got to claim blood. I've got my right. You've got to save me now because I've got the blood. We are, I think this way of doing it is clearly coming through that same infection of, of penal substitution and post law construct that we then use these things as commodities in some type of a brokerage account system to get our penalties paid, get our, our, our just due in some way, rather than the complete opposite, we have to come back to real worship in Eden, a relationship with him. We want to come back to the God who promises. We want to come back to know Jesus who did shed his blood. We want to come to a relationship with Christ who is righteous and participate in that righteousness. Basically, you're saying that on the whole, Christianity operates as our own organization and we ask God to join us. <laughs> yes. Yes, yes, yes. It's a very, the, the institution of the church oft, a, almost always ends up running like a, govern, a, a human organization with human constructs under an imperialistic system rather than running as God designed reality to run. And we teach that God runs his universe like we run our organizations. And I think it hurts people. Boy, there's so much in the lesson. I, I, I'm going to close, I'm, I'm going to jump right to this. I can't set it all up, but I got an email this week from um, Bob Reisfig, who uh, gave, sent me a, a picture of a, of a book, a picture of two pages in a book, The Letter to the Romans by William Barclay. Brilliant stuff. And I put it in the notes, and uh, you guys might want to hear this. It says, let us go to the prophets. The prophets spoke about the wrath of God, and very often their message was, unless men were obedient, the wrath of God would come upon them. I'm going to have to skip down. It says, uh, um... Now, if we were to put uh, this into modern language, we would use a different kind of terminology. We would say there is a moral order to the universe and the man who transgresses the moral order, the moral law sooner or later is bound to suffer. Uh, J.A. Freud, the great historian said, one lesson and one lesson only, history may be said to repeat with distinctness that the world is built somehow on moral foundation that in the long run it is well with the good and in the long run it will be ill with the wicked. The wrath of God, and I'm skipping portions, you should get the notes. The wrath of God is the inevitable punishment of sin. It is, it is there in the structure of the universe. And it is precisely from the consequences of our rebellion against that mortal, moral order that the love of God saves us. And I'm going to jump down to the end, very last part. It is Paul's argument about nature in nature, and it is completely valued that if we look at the world, suffering follows sin. 
Break the laws of agriculture, the harvest fails. Break the laws of architecture, your building collapses. Break the laws of health, your body suffers. Paul's saying, look at the world, see how it is constructed. From a world like that, you know what God is like. The sinner is left without excuse. It's just design stuff. It's built right in. It's really, really well, well done. Okay, let me have prayer and then I got a couple announcements. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that you are so amazing, that you have built your universe to operate in harmony with you. And in harmony with you is life, and his revival, and his regeneration, and his renewal. And so much of our understanding has been confused by this imperialistic system, Lord, that has taken over Christianity. We ask that you will pour out your spirit and empower us to see, discern, and live in harmony with your design and, and open avenues that this message can go forward and the world will be lighted and people will break free of that old system and you will come soon. We pray in your holy name. Amen. Okay, a couple of things. One, this week.